Hello everyone, Penguin Pilot here, and welcome to another video. Today we'll be covering VOR navigation. We'll discuss VOR types, classes, and their associated range, reverse sensing, and VOR receiver checks. As always, if these videos help you out, let me know by hitting that like button. Now, let's get started. Just like in VFR flying, there are three types of VORs. VOR, VOR with DME capability, and VORTAC, which has additional military uses, but for civilian use, is similar to a VOR DME. We also have three classes of VOR, terminal, low, and high. There are a few different ways to identify a VOR's class, but one way to identify a terminal VOR is by the T in their information. Likewise, low VORs can be identified by an L, but only on a high altitude chart. High VORs will have an H next to their name under the chart supplement. Now depending on their class, the VORs will only be effective for a certain range. Terminal and low VORs both have one set range, but high VORs will fluctuate depending on altitude. Now since most of your flying will be below 14,500, the way I recommend remembering this for now is 25, 40, 40. It makes it a little easier, and that's realistically what you'll be using for the time being. Now to make the most of this range, the FAA has designated changeover points when flying between two VORs. They're depicted by this symbol here. As you can see, this one is located 39 miles from Cincinnati and 25 miles from Shelbyville. If there's no changeover point listed, you should change VORs at the halfway point. This airway is 64 miles long, so we'd change over at 32 miles. Personally, I'd change over at the myelin waypoint, since it's pretty close and gives me a good reference point. Once you do change over, you need to make sure to input the proper course, otherwise you may end up getting what's known as reverse sensing. Reverse sensing is when you have the VOR set up incorrectly with the wrong radio, causing it to give you backwards turn directions. One way to think of this is pretend you're flying north, and you want to go to Jackson, so you ask your co-pilot with the map which way you should turn. Well, he thinks you're flying south, so he tells you to turn right. So you do. Now, not only should you probably get a new co-pilot, but you're also in Canadian airspace. Reverse sensing on a VOR is pretty similar, except now, the VOR is your co-pilot with the map, and you need to tell it which way you're flying. In this case, we have it properly set up tracking the 360 radio with a 2 indication, meaning if we deviate to the right or to the left, the needle will deflect in the correct direction, giving us proper turn indications. Now let's look what happens if we put the reciprocal radio in our course. We're flying north towards the VOR, but we're tracking the 180 radio with a from indication. Now if we deviate to the right or left, the needle is going to deflect in the opposite direction, because it thinks we're flying south, so it's going to tell us to turn to the left. You can see how this could very quickly get you into a pretty dangerous situation. So how can we avoid reverse sensing? Well fortunately, G-1000 aircraft don't have this problem, because they can use their GPS to confirm the location and correct your mistake. However, you don't want to rely on this, because you will fly a traditional VOR at some point in your career, and you definitely don't want to create a bad habit. That being said, there are a number of different ways to help you remember, but this is my favorite. In this example, we're currently flying eastbound, towards the VOR. We're on the 270 radio, and our course should be set to 090. When you're flying inbound to a VOR, your course and the radio you're on should be opposite. Inbound, opposite. Once we pass the VOR, we'll be flying outbound on the 090 radio, and our course will still be 090. When flying outbound, your course and the radio should be the same. Inbound opposite, outbound same. Now in order to even use a VOR for navigation, you have to have done a VOR check within the previous 30 days. The rules are located in FAR 91171, and they provide a few different ways to accomplish this. They include VOR test facility, or VOT check, a dual VOR check, ground checkpoints, or an airborne check. I personally use the VOT check quite a bit, but you have to make sure your airport has a test facility available. 
This can be found under the chart supplement, either under the particular airport's information, or near the back where they list all available VOR checks for that state. To perform the test, first, tune your receiver to the proper frequency. Next, the needle should center on 360 and 180. When it's on 360, the to from indicator should display a from reading. When it's on 180, it should display a to reading. A good way to remember this is to think of the Cessna 182 aircraft. Cessna 182. The maximum air allowance is plus or minus 4 degrees. So if it's centering on 175, for example, you'd be off by 5 degrees. For the dual VOR check, you'll need two VOR receivers. First, tune both of them to the same frequency and center both needles. Once you've done that, simply compare the indicated bearings from each receiver and ensure they're within 4 degrees of each other. Ground checkpoints can be found near the back of the chart supplement on the same page as the VOT checks. First, find the one for your airport, then tune your receiver to the listed frequency. Next, go to the checkpoint location on the airport, in this case, on the run-up for runway 01. Finally, compare the indicated bearing against what is listed. You should be no more than plus or minus 4 degrees off. Airborne checks are very similar. You'll tune the frequency like before and fly to the checkpoint. Now you'll notice that not only is there a location, but also an altitude now of 2,000 feet. Once there, compare the indicated bearing against what is listed. Since it's an airborne check and you'll be moving, they allow up to plus or minus 6 degrees of air. Now regardless of whichever of these checks you decide to use, the FARs do require that after performing a VOR check, you must enter the date, place, bearing air, and sign the aircraft log or other record. Most airplanes will have a designated form for this.